Splitting fighter aircraft up by generation is kind of a useless practice and likely won't be around for a whole lot longer. At least, that's a growing sentiment within the aerospace community, and to be honest, I'm kind of here for it. You see, fighter generational designations have been around for decades, but there are no universally accepted definitions for these terms, and there are no universally accepted criteria to fall in one generation or another. And what started as convenient shorthand to easily discern between the era in which one fighter was designed and another have now become little more than marketing terms that people, companies, and national governments can use to mean pretty much whatever they want. That's why Russia's Su-57 is so often touted as a fifth-generation fighter, despite having a radar cross-section that's likely comparable to many more advanced fourth-generation jets. This aircraft was designed with a focus on stealth, and as far as Russia's concerned, that's all it takes to meet that fifth-generation criteria. That's also why Northrop Grumman can tout their B-21 Raider as the world's first sixth-generation aircraft, despite not being a fighter at all. Honestly, at this point, calling something sixth generation is a lot like calling something organic. Most people don't really know what it means, but it sounds good. And that's why marketing teams use it. The idea of splitting fighter aircraft up into generations or stages or phases has been around for a long time, but the generational designations for fighters we know today really took root in the 1990s, much more recently than you might think. And as late as the mid-2000s, a lot of organizations and institutions still weren't even recognizing them. In 2004, NASA put out a document that split fighter aircraft up into five stages, starting with straight wing, going to swept wing, transonic, and then the 1960s and 70s. It was wild. But as we now mostly see it today, the majority of fighters in service as we speak belong to the fourth generation, which began in the early 1970s, maybe in 1974 with the F-14 Tomcat. The fifth generation, or stealth fighters, began in 2005 when the F-22 Raptor entered service, and now the sixth generation of fighters, which many people say are differentiated by their ability to fly with AI-enabled drone wingmen, should begin in 2030 or shortly thereafter when the next generation air dominance fighter is supposed to come online. But here's the problem. Depending on how you count them, there are between 40 and maybe 43 fourth generation fighters out there, whereas there are still only five fifth generation fighters in service around the world, despite those generations lasting about the same amount of time. And that is in part because fighters can do way more stuff than they used to be able to, so you need fewer different designs than you used to. But it's also because fighters are way more upgradable now. In older fighter designs, the hardware and software were pretty much married, so if you wanted to upgrade a system, you needed to actually remove physical components from the aircraft and replace them with new ones. And that meant putting the aircraft through a rigorous and expensive flight testing regime after to make sure those changes didn't negatively affect any of the other onboard systems. Whereas today, the F-35 can get over-the-air updates while the pilot is sleeping. And that's just the beginning. The U.S. Air Force and Navy have both been cleared that the sixth-generation fighters they have in development right now leverage open system software architecture and a modular design, which is a fancy way of saying they are supremely upgradable. That open system software architecture effectively means that the Pentagon owns the code that you use to make changes to the aircraft, so they are no longer beholden to any specific contractors. It doesn't matter who made the last component because the code it uses to communicate with the aircraft is owned by the DOD, so a different contractor can come in to build its replacement. And the modular terminology there means that the physical components in the aircraft are actually made to be pretty replaceable. They work sort of like building blocks, so you can assemble those same onboard components in a completely different aircraft design, fielding a fighter that looks nothing like the previous one, but internally is exactly the same. But that also means that you could replace one of those hardware components with an upgraded system as new technology emerges. And as long as it uses that same open system software architecture to communicate with all the other systems on board, it should be pretty plug and play. Meaning upgrading new fighters will be faster, cheaper, and easier than it has ever been in history. 
And that means it is really likely that we'll see new fighter designs emerge that will change over time with different iterations fielded with different modular systems on board that aren't different enough to justify being considered an entirely new generation, but are different from their predecessor. And that will very likely become the new standard, meaning we're likely looking at what could be the last generation of decade-spanning fighters that we may ever see. And that's something the Air Force has been pretty clear about, even about NGAD, with them now reassessing how they want to execute this contract at all, arguing that they may even want to field new fighters every five to ten years. That doesn't mean fielding new fighter designs like we did with the F-22 and the F-35, but rather fielding a new overall design that leverages those same modular systems that are already tested and already flying in a different shape aircraft, or an aircraft of the same shape but with some new capabilities added. And that really throws a wrench into the whole fighter generational designation concept, because most fighter generations are defined by three or four technologies or capabilities that just weren't widespread or available in previous generational designs. But now we will very likely see overall similar designs leverage all kinds of new technologies as time goes by. And to be honest, we are already seeing it. One of the most commonly accepted criteria for a sixth generation fighter today is flying with AI-enabled drone wingmen, but it's clear now that the first aircraft that are sure to actually do that will almost certainly be Block 4 F-35s rather than a sixth generation fighter at all. That's not all that weird. We usually see new technologies being tested in the previous generation of aircraft, but the F-35 is going to keep flying until at least 2088, meaning it'll spend the majority of its operational lifespan meeting that sixth generation criteria. And rather than calling it a 5.5 generation or a 5 plus or a 5 plus plus, maybe we can just acknowledge that this generational designation concept is more about marketing than it is about what fighters actually do. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you call an aircraft. What matters is if it works.